Steinberg's Dorico software has been around for about five and a half years now and is brought to us by the ex Sibelius team, who clearly know a great deal about score writing software. If you'd ever seen Daniel Sprobery's blog, which was around before Dorico was originally released, you'll have seen all of those little intricacies that you never really have to think about unless you're actually producing this kind of software. It didn't really find its way into my daily workflow until version 3, which introduced Guitar Tab, and version 3.5 was, I think, about two years ago that that was released. It's not seen that much development since, but Dorico 4 changes all that. There really is a great deal to cover, and we won't be able to cover everything because there is an absolutely staggering amount. I think the change list runs to about 90 pages. But anyway, in this video, we're going to cover the main changes and how I've been getting on with them, and let's get straight into it now. The appearance of the application has changed significantly, partly possibly to bring it in line with the iPad version, so this may not necessarily be something you're entirely happy with, but let's take a look at some of those changes now. So here we see the Dorico 3.5 Steinberg hub, so you can see it's probably something you've been pretty used to, it's, it's characterised, etc. It's, it's not looking too old, but it's not looking you know, brand new as it were. And let's just open up the Dorico Prelude in it. So you can remind yourself of what Dorico looks like. So here we see Dorico Prelude open up in 3.5 and we can see the setup, right, engrave, play with the mixer and finally print. Now let's take a look at Dorico 4. So here we see the Dorico 4 Steinberg Hub, and as you can see, we've got this open recent list and also create new. And this gives us a few options because we can insert things, time signatures, key signatures, number of bars, etc. So that can take away some of the boilerplate annoyance that you had to go through previously when, if you were somebody who always wrote in 4 4 and wanted a few bars present, then you could just use this instead of having to go through that. So let's open up Dorico Prelude. And take a look at that in Dorico 4. So we can see it's looking a fair bit smoother and slicker. Just It looks just a little nicer, really, doesn't it? It looks a little more finished. Now, many of the features are the same. There's a few things which have changed and a few things where the, the graphics have changed or things have moved slightly. But just with this overview, you can see that it, it looks a little bit more finished and a little bit more together than it previously did. Here we can see highlighted the changes in the play window. So you can see the much nicer mixer, but that is also available as a floating mixer. So here it is. Seems to have a bit of a problem of remembering its settings at the moment. but Hopefully that will be sorted out fairly quickly. But we can see while functionally it's not changed significantly, it's a lot nicer to work with. It's a lot more pleasant and the output sticks to the right hand side, which is for me, is the way that mixes like this always should default to. So the next big change is the lower zone, which has been changed significantly to give us a number of different features, the first of which is a key editor. So here we are in write mode and we can access the key editor by doing Command-8 or Control-8 and then clicking this button here. And here we can see the key editor in action. And we can scroll to find the notes in question. And we can see the familiar key editor, but it's, it's clearly improved compared to where we were previously. So we can highlight a note change its length as you would do before etc so we can change the played version of the note and keep the notated version of the note the same as before etc uh, there is some areas missing from this so we haven't got the full range of editing that you previously uh, would have in Dorico 3.5 but we have been promised that that is upcoming but it's possible to do a lot of your creation in the key editor itself So here we have a new project going to open up this zone here and then we can start just penciling in notes as before. Uh, 
So we can move these around. You can just use this as you would a standard key editor in any other application. Takes a little getting used to some of the controls and the way that it changes uh, focus depending on whether or not you've uh, done this. And the scrolling is a little bit glitchy at the moment. So as I scroll with the mouse wheel, you may see sometimes we get a bit of sort of stepping and glitching back, but generally it's working reasonably well. But you, you'll find this is a real boon if you're the kind of person who is much more happy in a key editor than you are with notation. So this will allow you to do a great deal of those kind of things, which if you come from a sequencing background, you will have found difficult when working with standard traditional notation. The lower zone has also been changed to allow us to view a mixer. So let's take a look at that now. So in addition to its brief appearance earlier, yes, the mixer can now be in the lower zone. So as you can see, we've got this resizable mixer. Again, it means you can quickly access the mixer without having to leave the right mode and you can keep the notation on screen while you are making those adjustments, which can be really useful. Obviously in this particular project, we've only got one track open, but if I go back to Dorico Prelude, you'll see we've got a full range of instruments available in the mixer here and it's nicely color coded as well it works pretty well allowing us to get a full range of these instruments accessed and changing the mix if needs be with the usable amount of controls which are available here now if you want any more you can go to the full mixer which is available in the play window but it's often useful to be able to change the levels here without leaving right mode. So again, that's a nice useful addition and good flexibility in terms of making the most of the screen space which is available. Finally, for the changes in the lower zone, there are a number of on-screen instruments. So let's take a look, starting off with the keyboard. So here we have a new project with a piano, electric guitar and drum set for reasons that will become apparent in a second. So. In play, we can do Command or Control 8 and open up the lower zone. And here we have Piano Keyboard, which if you play it when you're on the piano, gives you the ability to play that. Um, it works nicely. You can input your notes as you would expect by entering note edit mode. So here we can see... We can edit that. Let's just put that an octave higher. Make it look a bit neater. You've got access to these notes here, which makes it just easier to change uh, the duration of notes you're putting in without having to move around too much. So that works quite nicely. Uh, in addition, if you've got something already put in and you highlight it, you get to see where the note is on screen, which works quite nicely, probably be quite useful for people learning to go between the keyboard and standard notation. So here we have the uh, electric guitar with a fretboard. Now this fretboard will change depending on the instrument you've got set up. So if you set it up for a nine string guitar with appropriate tuning, it will appear like that. Banjo has missing bottom four frets, etc. That kind of thing works really nicely. So again, we can input music. So if I go into no input mode, uh, let's change to eights. And then I can play on here as you would do. And that all works fine. And again, you can play, click this and you see where it would be on the fretboard. It works really well. It works exactly the same if you've got notation being displayed as well. So here you can see it's working with the notation being played and it's reflecting what's what's present obviously on the fretboard here because it obviously uses the same kind of information. Works really nicely. It's nice to be able to see this. If you've got a chord being played, it will show all of those notes at the same time. So if you highlight that entire chord, we can see the entire chord being played on the fretboard all at once. And I quite like this uh, vibrating string kind of vibe. So you can see where the string is vibrating um, 
yeah, I quite like it. I think it works quite nicely. And the third is drum set. So again, we'll highlight the drum set. Click the drum pads. Now here we have the drum pads here. You can rearrange these so you can just add a space. We can put in a bit of space here, there and everywhere. We can move these around and so on. It's reasonably uh, powerful. And in fact, let's put the kick drum somewhere remotely sensible, shall we? Yeah, let's do that. There we've got our drum set. We can play different parts of it, etc. And again, you can play those and input them as as you go. So let's just put in let's just put in a little bit of snare drum. And then there we go. And even snare drum rim. And snare drum. So you can see it puts in those uh, articulations, which saves you having to find them and put them in from the sidebar, etc. So that that I found that pretty nice as well. In Dorico 4, finally, fretted instruments can have capos added. So let's take a look at how that's done. Now, related to the guitar input, kind of tangentially, is the ability to use capos. So this is something that's been missing from Dorico previously, and you can now create a capo. So it's, it's slightly fiddly. I found it slightly difficult to get my head around um, initially not because of the basics but because of uh something it does to do with chords but certainly what it does is it takes the notes that you've put in and changes them to go with the capo so for instance if we put a capo on at the fifth fret you can no longer play this note so what we'll do we'll put a capo on at the fifth fret and it will move this note sensibly and this will become zero etc so let's do that now so we go to setup expand the player and then we go to edit strings and tuning. Now under here, we can define a capo. So we'll click capo. We're going to say full capo. And I'm going to put it at the fifth fret, as mentioned earlier. And then OK. We see it appears here, clear as anything to remind you. And then if we go back to right, we can see it's being reflected here. So you can see that capo, nicely drawn. And also we can see now, say that, mo that note has moved because that C is no longer playable here because it was here. So it's had to move down a string and effectively up five frets. So it's now three frets above the capo. It is possible to change this, make it look like absolute, etc. It's not possible to play this lowest note in this G because obviously that's below the capo. Now, it is possible to transpose all this, etc. in the way that you might do if you were just going to say, well, I'm just putting on a capo. I'm going to transpose the whole thing. Uh, obviously, you can do that. Now, it is also aware of capo in terms of the chord symbols. So let's just add a chord symbol to this. And then let's add a diagram. With standard guitar tuning. So we can see that that C is there. But that C is not playable with that capo in place because we've got a capo at the fifth fret and you can't play below the capo so that doesn't quite work at the moment but it is possible for Dorico to take that into account now this is the bit that took me a bit of time fortunately Richard from the Dorico development team took the time to explain it to a musical imbecile like me how this works so you need to define this not on the capo instrument as it were but for the player so here we're going to go for the player here and then you see we can do show transposed or capo so chord symbol etc so you can show them transposed for capo but also above or below the main so here we're going to do show transposed chord symbol for capo and it says that's a c And then here we need to change this because you're playing a G on top of that. So once you've got that in there, say that's that's slightly fiddly, but this is the fifth fret. You're playing a G above that fifth fret, so that is a C chord. Um, 
yeah, and you can you can change the way that this appears. So you could have it as a G because you feel that it's a G, or you can change it so that it shows that symbol. So that's a C, even though it's a G shape because it's above that. So we've got all that flexibility in there. You can slice it anywhere you want, and definitely you can do exactly what you want in terms of the way that this works. But it might take you a bit of time to get your head around it, but I'm sure once you've done it a few times... Uh, as I now have, then then it's okay. It mo I thought it would be nice for it to be able to just set that automatically for you, but I see due to the flexibility of Dorico, it may not want to do that. And you have to visit a couple of different places to get all this working, but it certainly works. And it's certainly, as you would expect with Dorico, super flexible, can probably do everything. It can do weird half capos and all sorts of things, which is pretty incredible, really. Insert mode has always been really powerful in Dorico, but it's also been a bit tricky. There's some changes that have been made to make it more powerful and more useful, so let's take a look at them now. Insert mode is really useful, and we can stop where Dorico will insert music to, which is really useful. So on the system track here, we can pick a stop point. So let's say I want it to stop there. We will now no longer insert past there, so you'll see this in action. So I can activate insert mode here, turn it on, and let's just highlight this first note here. Go into note insert mode. I'm just going to insert just straight notes because I'm not going to do anything particularly interesting. And you'll see what happens. So as I insert at this point here, you see that this music moves to the end, but our chord is preserved, which is really nice because I can just keep inserting things. And this means it's much easier to insert new passages and change your phrases, etc., without effectively damaging what comes later on. That's really useful. And when you're done with that, and let's say we're done with that and we're done with insert mode, etc., we can then just drag this off to the end. So you see, I'll just drag this. And as soon as it becomes dotted, it goes to the end. Or we can just drag it to another place if we don't want to have to use the system track. So there I could put it to bar four. But here, if I just drag it off to the end, you see it becomes dotted and then it's gone. So that's really useful. I'm sure with a bit of uh, effort and practice and speed with that, you'll be able to create phrases much more quickly. And it kind of removes the needs for copying and pasting and, and putting things temporarily out of the way and this, that and the other, which is a quite a nice way to work. There's been some rationalisation of various menus, some of which appeared in different modes, some of which didn't. They now tend to be consolidated in one place. So let's take a look at some of those changes that have been made. Now, library is kind of a coalescing of uh, a number of previous settings, and I'm sure it will be much more useful to people who maybe have particular house styles that they will switch between on different projects. That's not the case in my particular case of use of Dorico, but it is useful not having the menus change as much as they did because there were some things which you could only get to in certain modes. So you would need to be engraved to get to some, play to get to others, write to get to uh, particular ones. Whereas now they tend to appear under library, which I think is more useful. But on top of that, the consistency is good because shifting sands I don't think is good for being able to remember exactly what's going on. But you also have the library manager. So the library manager covers engraving, layout, notation, note input and playback options, which is obviously a useful central way to have them, but also it allows you to be consistent across multiple projects and indeed across multiple users, which you say isn't something which I need to concern myself with but it will allow you to be much more consistent. So this is something that, as with much of Dorico, I've only really scratched the, the very surface of it because there is so much to it. I maintain genuinely to become super proficient in Dorico, I think you'd need to be using it all day, every day. And I'm definitely not one of those users. I can find my way around. I can create everything that I need to do in it, but I'm, I'm definitely not you know, a, a super expert user. I know the things that I know and I know how to convey them but I'm not using it all day, every day to produce, you know, Gregorian chants and nose, nose flute music and that kind of thing. But it is totally capable of doing that. And this library manager, say, makes it much more consistent, allows you to maintain consistency, say, across multiple projects, but also across multiple users, which I think will be uh, really useful for quite a lot of people. 
Another significant change in Dorico 4 is the ability to transform existing music. So let's have a look at that now. The new transform menu offers some useful ways of changing the notation that you've already got. So these are kind of common things such as inverting pitches. Quite a few options as ever. So here you can see we've got options for inversions, etc. We can reverse pitches, which is, again, these are kind of things that you can do manually, obviously, but it's much nicer if a computer does it for you. So why not make use of that? These are the kind of things you'd have to go through when you were doing uh, variations, etc. So it's quite nice to have it do this, particularly when they're those kind of things which would uh, make you scratch your head. So reversing rhythms, which obviously won't be apparent in this, but let's just make that the case. And then with those, we can reverse those rhythms and we see that that has swapped from there to there etc that kind of thing so again nothing necessarily uh, life-changing but it's the kind of thing which will save you having to do those um, slightly boring uh, mundane things that you have to do often whether they are for uh, exercises or for musical development which you feel is important but useful to have those there So play and the mixer is probably where this has seen some of the biggest changes and they're still not done. So there's some elements which are missing, but certainly this looks significantly different. So one of the first things is the tracks really now, you just use these to highlight which track you are dealing with, whereas previously you had controls in there. But instead you have an inspector with routing, insert effects and channel, much like you do in Cubase. This has become a much more Cubase-like uh, affair here in terms of the inspector and you have the vst rack where in this case we only have one instance of halion sonic se which these are all feeding on different midi channels we have the mixer at the bottom as seen previously but there's also the floating mixer which say doesn't remember its settings at the moment but is resizable so you can resize it to your heart's desire and i quite like the fact you can take these off the bottom if you want to do that and you can do what you want with them it works really nicely fluidly we've got inserts and eq as previously and a single send at the moment so whether or not we'll ever get the ability to add sends i'm not sure but in that one send you can at least add extra inserts so it defaults to using reverence but you can add an extra effect in there etc if you want to do that kind of thing so this hasn't really changed much in terms of function it's got slightly better in terms of this because we don't have the extra features that we didn't have to have and also it works uh, a lot more nicely it looks a lot nicer than the old mixer does obviously mute and solo uh, pan etc and faders so mostly cosmetic changes here i think but it certainly works more nicely now the key editor at the bottom here so those of you who are familiar with Dorico will know that this is a reasonable change from what was present before. So you can see there's a little bit of glitching in the scrolling here. Uh, but we can go from what's heard. So this is the notes which are being heard. So here I can change the length of that particular note. So let's just solo just this one horn part. And we can see if I play it from here, yeah i've changed that even though the notation hasn't changed so this is a feature which was already in uh dorico previously but it's it's quite a nice thing to be able to do because it obviates so many things we used to have to do with cubase score etc and here we're looking at that so here if you edit this if we go back to the uh, notation editor so if i change this here and then we go back to notation we'll see at this point here the third beat of bar one we will see now that that has changed to an eighth note because we've changed the notated part. So this is changing the notation. This is changing how it's being heard. So we could leave the notation like that, but change its sounding, etc., and even have things overlapping and so on. You can select multiple notes by clicking. Now, what you have to do this takes a little bit of getting used to is you click and hold and then it goes into sort of multi-select mode and then you can marquee and create a button there. I think that's 
it feels like a legacy from sort of touchscreen. I've not used Dorico on the iPad, so maybe I'm I'm not reading the right end of the room, as it were. But that that feels like that's what that's from. It's like you have to touch it for a while to get that to work. Now, when we move into editing velocities, etc., so I'm just going to move down here, expand this. We get some extra tools, so you can highlight multiple velocities. You're using that same tool here, but it, it's not. We can just scale, really. So if we want anything more advanced than that, then pick this multi-select tool here, click and hold, and then now we've selected those. Now we get these extra tools around the edge. Now these will be familiar, but not exactly the same, but familiar to you if you've used Cubase before. So we've got tilt, uh, tilt in and tilt out, as it were. Now we've got percentage change here, so that will scale them. And we can see those differences are getting bigger as we go up. And we've also got delta. Now that maintains the differences between them, but just scales them in a linear manner. So you can see there, we're just adding or subtracting a certain amount. And finally, we've got randomness. So as I move around, we can see we're getting randomness. If I move up, we get even more randomness and everything goes uh, all over the place. But we can just have just a little bit of randomness or a lot. And that can be quite useful if you just want to put in some variation very quickly without having to uh, redo everything. Now in the histogram here, we can make some edits here. So this is uh, reasonably complicated now because of the just, I haven't got much variation in here. So there's not going to be that much variation, but we can edit those around here. We can make some changes to control that width. And we can see we can, we can spread those things out. So if we go back to the standard editing here and let's zoom out and let's highlight everything so just going to click and then once we get multi-select i'm going to select the whole thing and let's just put in a bit of randomness so not a massive amount and now let's have a look on the histogram and here we can see all those changes so we can see that and if you want to narrow those changes up you can bring them in etc so you can do some pretty advanced uh editing in here and this is actually something i think possibly needs to go back to Cubase because I quite like this. I think I'd quite like this to, to do in my DAW. So that would be useful. So we've got that ability to effectively alter the, the, the bell curve that we've got here. We can control those by percent or by delta. So you see there, they're not changing at all here. We are getting some changes between them and we can just scale one end of the curve in or we can scale another end of the curve in, or we can do the whole thing. So we can just spread out those velocities, which I, I really like. So uh, yes, Steinberg, can we have that, please? And again, we can put in a bit of randomness as well. And you can see that's affecting all of those elements of that curve. So this is quite nice having sort of statistical uh, manipulation of those, those velocities and altering that. So this is certainly a lot more powerful than it used to be. It's missing the ability to edit the playing techniques lane at the moment. And there's a couple of other little things which will be coming in. So hopefully they will be coming in fairly soon. But as you can see, there's some useful increases in functionality here, even though there's maybe a, a, a hint of the smell of touch somewhere lower down in the user interface. Whenever any application gets above a certain number of options, it can become difficult to navigate. So you need some way to help you to do this. With uh, a computer, I often use a assistant. So in this case, I use a thing called Alfred. I type out spacebar, and then I type in the name of the program that I want. So if I want Dorico, I just type D-O-R, and I get only the options I want. I can navigate with the keyboard. It means I don't have to point at things. Now, navigation in Dorico has been an issue traditionally because there are so many options and there need to be because score writing is complex. Fortunately, we now have the jump bar, which is accessed with J on your keyboard. It has two modes. So it's got commands and go-to mode. So if I type IMV because I want to invert these pitches, do that, hit enter, we get the invert pitches dialog box and I'm in business. I've not had to navigate a menu. So let's just cancel that for the moment. So pretty much anything you want will come up. So again, hit J. Invert pitches was a previous one in there, but I can just type in a new one. So let's look at layout options. 
and we can see all of these. So layout options there, and we can see the keyboard shortcut should you want to use it in the future, etc. That's useful, but another thing which I've always found slightly tedious uh, with a lot of school writing programs is navigation, because moving around is can be a little bit tricky. Now, you have a navigation mode, so to switch to go-to mode, you switch between the modes on a Mac with Control 1 and Control 2. So you can see I'm changing from commands to go to mode. On Windows, it's Alt C and Alt G for command and go to mode, but it does the same kind of thing. And then you've got a shorthand of how you can access different parts of your score. And this is this is pretty straightforward. So if you want to go to a particular bar, you just type B and then the bar you want to go to. So let's go to bar 20, hit B20. And there we are, we're at bar 20. Simple as that. If I want to go back to the beginning, J, B1, done. No more furious scrolling through hundreds of pages, etc. You can get there really quickly. If you want to go to a specific flow, works the same but with F. So I've got a little flow here, flow two. And I can go back to flow one. But I can also go to flow and a particular bar. So I can go to flow one bar 16. And there we go, we're in there. There are uh, rehearsal marks as well. So I've got a few rehearsal marks in here. So if I want to go to rehearsal mark B, I just go to J, rehearsal mark B. And there we go, I'm in business. So there are some other things. You can go to pages as well, this, that, and the other. It's it's super powerful, but it's the kind of thing that's subtly super powerful. It's I think if you, if you use this and get into using it, it just makes navigation so much easier, even if it was just the go-to mode, but with the commands as well. Say so those commands that you you know where they are, you know what they are, but you don't know where they are. They're hidden in some menu or other. So the analogy I often use for this is the difference between somebody just pointing at things and being able to use language to say it. So, you know, if you imagine a, a baby who is pre-speech pointing at something they want versus somebody saying, I say, old chap, can you hand me that blue bottle off of the third shelf? Thank you very much. It's it's that kind of level of uh, expression and eloquence, as it were. So it just means you can move around much more quickly. And the jump bar is going to be on my screen quite a lot. Talking of which, getting off the screen, you just press escape. So once it's there, hit escape and it's gone. Darko now includes a few extra plugins. So let's take a look at those in action. So supervision may be something which you're not familiar with if you're not a Cubase user, but you can put it in your insert. So I'm going to put it in as insert three. So just scroll to that, select it there. Now, initially it starts out uh, fairly mundane. I'm going to play music, but I'm not going to play the music uh, in the background of this just in case I get some kind of bizarre copyright strike. So it starts out being a fairly mundane stereo uh, VU meter, but you can add the extra sections to it. So here I'm going to split it horizontally. I'm going to drag it a bit bigger. And then in this bottom section, once that's highlighted with a white line around it, I'm going to change it from level. Let's go to spectrum curve. And we can get an idea of the frequencies which are happening across this domain. Uh, let's change this top section to something a little more fun. Let's go for VU meter. So we can see that we've got a fairly low level up there at the moment, but you get the idea. This is going to be useful just so you can get an idea of what you're actually outputting. Uh, it's the kind of tool that I think if you if you need this, you probably probably would already have something like this. Uh, but it is useful to just get an idea. And if you send off a mix to somebody and they say, oh, you know, you've got something really strong at 1K or whatever, this will give you the ability to look at it uh, and maybe change your mix and see what's happening to do that. And also, if you just solo an instrument, you can get an idea of what frequency ranges are actually being generated by those uh, synthesized, in this case, instruments. So you can get an idea of, of what's going on. It definitely has some nice features. Uh, it's worth checking out. There's a video on the channel when this came out because this came out with the previous version of Cubase. Uh, it's it's a nice tool. It's not uh, amazing, but certainly as an included tool, it's it's reasonably useful. So similar to Supervision, you've been gifted um, VST Amp Rack and VST Bass Amp. So I'm going to just look at VST Amp Rack. This allows you to add effectively an amplifier 
speakers, microphone and effects pedals to a guitar sound. So here is a guitar study which I created for my Dorico book. And as an insert on this particular channel, so here's our electric guitar, but it's just a clean electric guitar sound. So if we just have a quick listen to how that actually sounds at the moment. It sounds like a clean electric guitar, which is, after all, what it is. But we can go to insert effects here. So notice that this is the same as the effects in the mixer. You're doing the same thing in a different place. And we're going to go to VST Amp Rack. Click the E, and here we can pick. We've got pre-effects, amplifiers, post-effects, microphones, configuration, etc. Now, if you find this bewildering, don't worry too much about it because there are plenty of presets. So you just click in the box up here, and then you can pick something. Let's pick back hole bun because that sounds like a great pun. So we press play now. You can hear we're getting a, a kind of distorted one and we can flick through these as we go with different effects. Now, it's never going to be a replacement for a real electric guitar, etc. But that, for instance, sounds a bit less offensive than the, the super clean electric guitar sound. So, yeah, and that's not too bad as well. You know, it's, a, it's never going to be a perfect replacement for a real guitarist playing through a real setup, but it's not too bad. And it's if you need a bit more convincing and people need a bit more... Uh, if they're lacking in imagination, let's put it that way, yeah, this could be the difference, which you need to, to get an idea. And then obviously then once they've commissioned you, you can get the real guitarist in and make a much better job of it, etc. There's a video elsewhere on the channel on the new Steinberg activation and licensing system, but let's take a quick look at it in action now. Now, licensing, this is this is one thing. There is a more full video uh, elsewhere on the channel, but this is the first product which doesn't have a dongle in terms of sort of the professional products, which would have previously had a hardware dongle. So it uses the Steinberg Activation Manager. In short, this is a, an electronic version of your license. You are allowed to have up to three machines licensed per a copy of Dorico that you have. So that shouldn't be too much of a problem. You can deactivate them and then activate a different machine, providing those machines are connected to the internet. But once you've activated, you don't need to reconnect. So there's no phoning home system. The original plan was it was going to be 30 days. It would have to uh, reactivate afterwards. But this is now going to be a, a permanent installation. So providing you don't have uh, hardware issues and uh, need to reinstall, you won't need to reconnect your computer to the internet again this and the other. So let's just take a very quick look at it. So here we have the activation manager. And as you can see, I'm signed in. I've got Dorico Pro 4 activated. If I wanted to deactivate it, I could click here. That would deactivate it. And now my license is online. I would have one more license available. I could go to another machine and activate it, or I can just reactivate this machine here. If I try and run Dorico without an activation happening, what happens is it gets automatically activated and then the next time I try and run Dorico, it runs and it's happy. It's it's much the same as if you didn't have your dongle plugged in and then you had your dongle plugged in. So I'm sure this will all be ironed out and will work. But also I'm sure that because it's a new system, there will be people who have problems with it. It may not work on a particular computer. I, there will be people where that is the case, whereas at the moment dongles are a fairly uh, well-proven technology. But they have some downsides. So there's more details on this in the full video, which is elsewhere on the channel. But if you're just a generic standalone user who just has one uh, user account on their machine, I think it will probably work for you pretty well. So in addition to the significant changes, which we've already covered, there's a great deal of minor improvements and bug fixes and changes which have been made. It runs to about 50 pages in the release notes. And considering that many of those pages just feature lines and lines of single sentences per change, you can see there's quite a lot of changes which have happened. However, it's not all good news. There's a couple of features in the key editor which are missing in this current release, although we have been promised by the developers that those will be included in an update which is going to come fairly soon, 
after this initial release. So, in summary, is Dorico 4 worth it for you? And that, I really genuinely think, is a question that only you can answer once you've been equipped with the right kind of information. Hopefully, I've been able to provide some of that. If you're the kind of person who knocks up a lead sheet once every six weeks in an earlier version of Dorico, it may not be that Dorico 4 has got any features which will be new and worthwhile for you. If you're somebody who's producing guitar transcriptions for pupils who use capos all the time, clearly it's going to be perfect for you. I fall nearer the second camp, and for me, the improvements with fretted instruments and capos, the changes to mixer, and also the changes to the play page really mean that for me, it's a no-brainer. But I know everyone's not in that same position. In addition to this, the Apple M1 support is going to be important to me in the future, as I'm fortunate enough to have a 16-inch MacBook Pro on the way. And Steinberg activation is going to be really useful for me because while I was a fan of dongles, it, there have been a couple of times when I'd forgotten my Dorico dongle when I was out on the road and needed to come back to get it. And yeah, granted, I could forget my laptop, but that's as indivisible as it gets. So the activation is really going to be useful for me. You may not be in the same boat. But obviously, it's up for you to decide. So as ever, I hope you found this useful. And if you have, please like, subscribe, discuss, etc. Uh, there will be a new version of the Dorico book coming, but I'm only going to release it once the key editor is complete because there's a couple of bits and pieces which are currently missing, which will be included in a future release. And once that's in place, then the book will be released, updated to Dorico 4, because there are some quite significant changes to the way the application performs. But as ever, I hope you found this useful. And if you have, we'll see you again soon for more Music Tech Tuition.